The, re the revolution is real, it's live, and as some comrades say, it's lit, right? <laughs>
various other places around the world. And this is something that uh, is done under the leadership of this uh, remarkable uh, director of agitation and propaganda, a young woman, Akili Anai, uh, who is, has clearly demonstrated to be one of the best daughters of Africa, uh, who has um, taken the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, uh, under which um, our newspaper, uh, our other means of communication uh, occur, and she has, has pulled it together uh, and done things with it that uh, no one who has had responsibility for this department has ever done before. And so uh, I wanted to, to say that about the job that she has done. And also I wanted to commend um, uh, the manager, the station manager of uh, Black Power 96.3 uh, uh, FM, uh, Comrade Timber. And the, together what they have done is truly turn uh, Black Power 96.3 uh, uh, into an, a real institution of the African working class. Uh, our radio station has been here uh, for two years or so. Uh, but uh, over the last several weeks, we've seen a magnificent transformation of the station. And uh, we've seen more integration of the whole African working class, particularly in St. Petersburg with the station. Uh, we've seen uh, people who walk uh, through the doors and have contributed to the fundraiser that we're doing now. Uh, uh, many of our listeners in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, don't uh, participate that much over uh, with the computers uh, and what have you, uh, but they hear us and then uh, they often come by the station uh, to provide, to, to make their contributions or they see uh, representatives of Black Power 96 in the streets in our communities and they make their contributions. It, it has just been really transformed. You can hear the African working class uh, from all walks of, of life uh, on this radio station in a, a thousand different ways and I want to express my appreciation and I want to call on everybody here uh, and everybody who can hear us, everybody who appreciates uh, this study that we do every Sunday at 8 Eastern time uh, to make a contribution. I think that um, the month of February uh, is uh, the goal, the fundraising goal is $7,000 for this month. We we'll take more than that. I'm sure that anybody who wants to make a $7,000 contribution uh, will be welcome, uh, but we still have the whole month to go and we would still be trying to uh, secure more resources because there's so much more that we need to be able to do with the radio station and we can use everything that can be provided. I think that one thing should be recognized is that when we look at uh, uh, Comrade Sister uh, Akile Anai, uh, somebody who has assumed responsibility of this radio station, uh, of the entire Department of Agitation and Propaganda, it clearly demonstrates uh, something about our movement and about our party. And we've said it all along, uh, that uh, coming into our party, a person can be anything. Uh, and I'm sure that two years ago, that Akili and I had no uh, assumptions that she would be running radio stations, running newspapers, uh, running various other uh, kinds of uh, uh, platforms in order to communicate with people, providing political education to not only within the party itself, within the Uhuru movement, but to Africans at large. And uh, I think that, that a statement of support for this kind of movement, this kind of effort, this kind of radio station would be, uh, you have to provide the contributions that make the station everything that it can be that it needs to be because it is a station that relies on support uh, from you, uh, those of you who listen to the radio, who participate in this study. Our responsibility through uh, Omari Taught Me is to raise uh, $2,000. And uh, I would like to go ahead and do that quickly as opposed to uh, trying to say, well, we'll do it before the month is out. I would like to go ahead and do that quickly. 
$2,000 uh, today uh, would be helpful. Uh, so this is a call for people to uh, join in on the sun fundraising drive for 96.3 and uh, support this radio station. It is your radio station. You know that. So I'd like to thank everybody for being here to participate in this discussion of African internationalism on love. It has been mentioned that uh, this study comes from uh, a book uh, that we published years ago uh, titled Not One Step Backward, The Black Liberation Movement from 1971 to 1982. And what we uh, will be discussing today, African internationalism on love, uh, is actually a transcription of a presentation that I made on September 1st, 1978 at a African People's Socialist Party conference that was a conference banquet that was held uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. So that's what we're going to talk about on today. I got a phone call uh, last night from my youngest daughter, Kenya, who I think is probably um, participating in this study. It was a very moving um, phone call for me. Uh, she called because she had just seen uh, the YouTube uh, video of the Oxford uh, debate, um, that a documentary of sorts had been put together by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda uh, from, from our party. And uh, she expressed how moved she was uh, by seeing that uh, debate and seeing the presentation, rather, that I made at that debate and uh, the fact that um, I was uh, in the center of this, uh, this factory, <laughs> if you will, this, uh, of, of uh, bourgeois uh, intellectual um, um, development. And uh, to be there and, and uh, to make the presentation that I made, how, th how thrilled she was to see uh, the African working class stand up uh, at Oxford Union, at Oxford, and, and to make that presentation. And she said something that was really moving to me that, um, that I never really talk about. Um, and she said that uh, she had, over the years, uh, been uh, learning uh, about uh, my love for, for, for her, uh, for my children, but it's not something that uh, has always been understood, nor easily understood. Uh, in fact, um, because of what I do, um, that has been, it's been difficult for, uh, for my children. I've, I have children who, for example, said to me some years ago, I don't, I don't think they have this feeling now, but when they were children, uh, how they hated black power because their black power meant that uh, their father was always going to be in jail or uh, they would be deprived of this relationship with me. But she said that Kenya uh, told me that um, when I made, when she saw the presentation at Oxford, uh, she saw a presentation of love uh, for African people. Uh, and and she, was, she said she was moved uh, to tears or near tears uh, watching that and drinking that in and understanding that everything that I've done and have always done uh, has been uh, for her and for uh, my biological children as, as, as well as for uh, all of us and the African children all around the world. And that she, she said that uh, what she saw with the debate in Oxford really uh, brought that home to her uh, in a way uh, that she, she had never understood in such a fashion uh, before then. So I was really moved by that. And I, you know, we, we want to talk about this question of love, and it's something that she said that she was able to recognize in terms of the love that I have for her, because it's not easy. It hasn't been easy for them. My children have, have caught hell for, in various ways uh, because of this uh, participation, and at some juncture, um, uh, I have uh, been accused and probably engaged in and, and saying this myself, that I was not a good father, but uh, I don't think that's true because I think overall that, that my family, um, uh, my children, uh, was much larger, much greater uh, than those who were biologically uh, from me. 
and that there's no way in hell that um, I could love my children uh, with the consciousness that I have without being constantly engaged uh, in a struggle to overturn, to destroy forever, uh, all that would, would take away their freedom, their, their dignity, and, and what would make them uh, the human beings that they could be uh, under normal circumstances. So um, anyway, so we're looking at African internationalism <laughs> on love. And uh, this is how it begins on page 103 uh, from the book, um, Not One Step Backward. Everybody should, should have this text. And it reads, what I want to talk about is different from what we've been talking about in the recent past, which is one of the reasons we need to talk about it. What we need to talk about is love. We need to talk about love for a number of reasons partially because of the kind of contradictions we see occurring within our communities throughout this country. These contradictions have their bases in history, some of it we call natural history. That is to say, history that flows from the natural consequences of black people coming together to try to procure those things necessary for our existence. Some of them are unnatural contradictions in the sense that they are contradictions which flow from having a foreign power imposed on our lives so that everything that happens within, that happens within an attempt to, uh, to develop is distorted and does not happen naturally. There is no way that a colonial and subject people can live a natural existence. There is absolutely no way for that to be true. These contradictions, and I think it's important to say that because we have certain expectations um, in our lives and for our lives and for our communities and for our people and for our young people and for women and men and uh, et cetera, uh, that's based on a narrative that's created by our oppressors for the most part. That's, that's the standard, the template of what is normal, what should be. I remember growing up as a child and uh, people who, uh, uh, involved in this discussion would be too young to remember, but there was this show of Ozzy and Harriet, which was uh, the ideal uh, family, and it was a white family, uh, the, the Nelsons, Ozzy and Harriet Nelson. Uh, and and uh, I, I would watch this family, and I would uh, feel disgusted with my own uh, situation because uh, our family never sat down or seldom sat down together and we'd all eat at the at the same table and, and, and dad, you know, would you know, drop gems of wisdom at the table and mom uh, would uh, be there pristine and, and, and fresh and what have you, uh, you know, presiding, the matriarch presiding over the situation. We never had that stuff. I mean, my mama was working all the time. <laughs> And my daddy was working all the time, and often we end up, you know, we'd fix it ourselves. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes, as compared to the Nelson, I mean, we lived in a house when I was a child where literally um, you could uh, be in bed and look up and see through, you know, cracks in the ceilings and stuff like that. That was quite different from Ozzy and Harriet. But Ozzy and Harriet was the standard uh, that had been established for what a family should be, and that was the norm as we understood it. It was something that we could never live up to, and so that left a certain taste in our mouths and a certain negative assumption about who we were uh, as Africans, even though uh, there was no statement that Africans are horrible because you don't live like Oz and Harry. didn't have to make the statement that said, this is normal, this is normal. And then if we didn't live up to that norm, the statement was, was, uh, was implicit. Uh, there. So we say these contradictions manifest themselves as contradiction between our young people and, and old people. We've seen that for, uh, we've seen that uh, for a person of my generation. Uh, that's a very interesting and serious kind of contradiction. A person of, of our generation remembers a, a period when if you said something wrong or bad, uh, uh, if you said something wrong to an old person, an old African, uh, you understood that something bad was going to happen to you. That was, that, that was the way 
that, that was a way we showed a great deal of respect for our, for our elders. So this contradiction that appeared to be between old people and young people was, was uh, extraordinary and foreign. I mean, I, as a child, I remember even if I thought bad things about an old person, I wondered if something horrible was going to happen to me. That was the most incredible thing, to think something bad or say something bad about an older person. Um, so living with this contradiction, for persons of, of my generation in particular, this contradiction that appeared to exist between old and young people was phenomenal. Contradictions exist in our community between African men and African women. Women are responding to very, very real material phenomenon uh, in the world which oppresses women in a fashion that uh, when it is not understood, deepens the contradiction in our community. Uh, we see men, African men, who don't understand who we are, uh, but sometimes who, who do understand who we are and who our enemy is, and rather than face and deal with that, because it is a terribly dangerous con uh, confrontation, provoke serious contradictions with women in our community, creating a very unnatural situation. So there are a lot of contradictions in our community between our people throughout the world. There are contradictions and, and many of these make it difficult at this juncture in our history to talk about such a thing as love. Another thing that, that makes it difficult to talk about such a thing as love, and which obviously has affected those of us involved in the progressive pro-independence movement, has been our recent attempt to deal with struggles scientifically and the influence on our movement by the ideological imperialists, by those North American forces who have considered themselves scientists and who, based on their understanding of the world, reject uh, very seriously the concept of love as having anything, uh, any kind of uh, influence uh, in struggle. And um, I, I, I mentioned this whole, this is 1978 when this was written, and uh, the party was involved itself in a very serious struggle uh, to try and introduce the, the issue of science into uh, our movement, but there was also this contest that the movement was having at the same time uh, with the forces that we call ideological imperialists. Sometimes we call them Ku Klux communists. These were uh, white people, uh, mostly young people, mostly uh, students who would uh, descend from the ivory towers and uh, come to our communities to try and lead us to freedom and bring science to our movement, um, and who uh, uh, despised almost everything that we were doing, but they were going to bring enlightenment and teach us how to have a scientific approach. And according to their scientific approach, often uh, they would uh, tell us that, uh, that love is not important, that emotions are not important, and that what we must have is a scientific theory. And it is true, we must have a scientific theory. In fact, one of the reasons we were so easily moved, that is to say, the black movement was so easily moved negative, negatively around the question of love is because we had allowed ourselves for a very long period uh, to talk about f freeing ourselves based on emotions and the way we feel or the way we felt. Uh, quote, we are going to be free because we are black, we are bad, unquote. So we said, but there was nothing scientific about that and it didn't give us any kind of information that was going to provide any leadership for our struggle. So we are in a very interesting situation. Love is not a thing that is talked about very much. But we should not have a problem saying that we are motivated in our struggle because we love our people. We shouldn't have a problem saying that. Prior to that juncture in our history when the back of the black liberation movement was broken, our warriors killed and arrested, uh, and the struggle in our community defined by people who were external to our community, by people who did not uh, have a material interest uh, in our community, by people, as Malcolm might say, who don't look like us, people who obviously have a different understanding of who we are and uh, whether uh, who we are and whether we should love ourselves and each other. We know uh, through, though, that prior to all of these occurrences, we did talk about love. We don't talk about this too much anymore, but we should not be ashamed of that. Malcolm X uh, talked about love a little bit. I remember a speech that he made in Harlem where he said, tomorrow, they're going to be saying that Malcolm X uh, is talking hate talk. 
But this is not hate talk. This is love talk. I would not tell, I wouldn't tell you these things if I didn't love you, unquote. This is what Malcolm X said, and that's true. It's a thing that we have to keep before us uh, that there is nothing wrong with loving people, with loving our people. Another fellow who was external to our movement and who had many African people confused at one juncture so that they wanted to be Afro-Argentinians and Afro-Cubans said something about love. His name was Che Guevara, and it's a poor paraphrase, but he said, quote, at the risk of sounding ridiculous, I have to say that revolutionaries are motivated by great feelings of love, unquote, and that is true. Because you can't do the things that we do simply based on an ideological truth. We can't do the kind of struggle that I've seen our comrades do. When I say struggle, I don't mean necessarily something that is intense and happens quickly and is over soon. Uh, that may have to do with life or death, although I saw that as well. I'm talking about the kind of struggle that lasted three and four years of, of not having enough to eat, not having a place to stay, not having friends and comrades to be with, but doing the work for black people. I'm talking about the period uh, defined as a lull when it's not exciting to do the work with the masses. Comrades from our party worked and struggled during this period and as a result of not having the resources having jaws that look like inverted eggs, sunken from being hungry. A simple ideology would not allow us to have the strength to do that. Ideology is good because it informs our practice and tells us how to move and around what questions we ought to move. There's a practical application of the theory, but ideology alone cannot do that. And this is 1978, and this is in Atlanta, and this is a time when in Atlanta, in Atlanta uh, the party worked in an area called Vine City. Uh, that is a historic community in, Al in Atlanta. At one time, even uh, Garvey's uh, uh, Liberty Hall was uh, located in Vine City. And in Vine City, the work we did, we lived in, in, uh, often in collectives, uh, sometimes uh, literally, that, <laughs> that didn't even have doors on hinges, uh, that uh, you, we'd leave and lean the door up uh, on the on the on on the wall and and, and the entrance and uh, you know put it take it down to enter and, and to leave and put it back up that kind of thing and where uh, at at junctures uh, where uh, the the uh, government would come and turn off the water because we didn't pay the bill and then as soon as they left of course we'd go and turn the water back on and we had these kinds of battles and people went without resources and that's because their commitment was really to overturning the contradictions of our people, our making this revolutionary movement for black people. And you can't do that if you don't have a deep and profound love for the people. And ideology, of course, informs us about how that could, should be articulated in the world, but uh, one has to have that kind of commitment. And there's always an attack, a war going on African people against our, our, our self-regard. There's an, always a war that's being made against our self-regard. Uh, but these comrades uh, who you won't read about, you won't read about Sabir, uh, you won't read about uh, uh, these comrades who worked in Atlanta uh, under these kinds of circles and other places where the party was located. I mean, you know, uh, when I first went to Atlanta to organize on a permanent basis, I just had a phone number and a contact, uh, no money. I had a, a big red uh, Samsonite suitcase filled with books. Uh, that I travel everywhere with, uh, and, and uh, the sister who I, I stayed with, um, uh, I went to, I looked in a refrigerator hoping to find some food, and the only thing in there was an apple, <laughs> and it was rotten. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, th this, <clears throat> but we did this work. Mawala K. Thing was there with us. We did this work on a, on the, you know, these kinds of uh, circumstances, but one had to have a real deep and profound commitment of, of love, and, and we had love discussions. I mean, Kefing and I and other comrades talk about the love for the people and appreciation for the people, and that's what informed us. That's what sent Kefing out almost every day with the Burning Spear newspaper. He said, if you got nothing to do, you feel demoralized, pick up a stack of Burning Spear newspapers and go out to the mass and sell the paper, and you'll see how quickly <clears throat> your morale is, is raised, and, and what it means to go out 
and express this expression of love for African people. <clears throat> we know many professors who can quote ideological positions and formulations much better than our comrades can, but they don't have the love for the people that makes it possible to do the kinds of things that our comrades have done, the kinds of things we just saw in the process of building the Youth Committee uh, for Justice for James Daniels. James Daniels was an African here. His name was Willie James Daniels. That's what I'm talking about. Is it Willie James Daniels that I'm thinking about? Uh, who was murdered by the police in St. Petersburg, Florida. And, you know, we organized around those, uh, that in, in very serious and difficult kind of circumstances. And we were confronted all the time with, <clears throat> with Africans who didn't have the capacity to love them th themselves. And in this instance, I'm talking about people who were called leaders, <clears throat> who, when James Daniel was murdered by the police, who show up in the back seat of the police car because Africans have gathered uh, ready to do something about it. And the role of the so-called leaders was to come and make Africans and uh, quell any kind of uh, disturbance uh, to, to suppress the uh, resistance of, of the African population. That was, not, that was not love of African people. That was a commitment and relationship to the state. That was love of white power, love of white people. And in uh, uh, and, 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 and fact, it was uh, being flattered by the fact that the police would ask them to ride in the car and come uh, to suppress the resistance of the people. But those people who we were organizing, those young people and others uh, who were responding, that was love because uh, the police, got to remember, the police had killed uh, Daniels. That means it was a clear demonstration of the willingness of the police to kill you. And yet, here we had these young people who would organize against the same police that demonstrate that we are killers, we will kill you, we will wipe you out. It took love uh, for our community and for our people and for Willie James Daniels, for people to be able to do that. That's the kind of thing that we are talking about. We're talking about families and communities who have made that kind of commitment. And uh, that's bigger than our own personal uh, uh, individual interests. The reason that uh, the things these youth do is so striking is because those, these, those comrades are young, finger-popping comrades. Uh, these are not folk uh, who came out of some monastery or, or nunnery or whatever you call places where nuns be. Uh, young finger-popping, bee-bopping uh, comrades who, who every night uh, uh, been selling uh, fish sandwiches, been passing out leaflets, been knocking on doors, been confronting the police department and the power of the state because of the rage that they feel and the love that they feel for black people around the death of James Daniels. See, we need to talk about love sometimes. You see, when we talk about science, we have to understand science from a perspective that speaks from the development of our own people. Science is not innocent. There is a perspective, a scientific perspective, that, that will have you uh, in the face of starvation, poverty of masses of people around the world, in the face of people who are struggling to free themselves from uh, imperialist power. There is a science that comes that will build an atomic bomb uh, to make sure that you dominate the world and keep people oppressed and living in starvation and intimidated. That's a science. But that's not a science that uh, speaks to the interests of the masses of the people and certainly not to the interests of African people. Science in our possession would feed, clothe, and house our people and destroy our enemies so that we can have, so the whole people can be free. Uh, <clears throat> so they say science and mean one thing, and we say science and mean something else. We have to talk about it from the perspective of an and historical development of our own people. See, sometimes it's difficult for people to love themselves, <clears throat> and you know that. Anybody who's ever been in prison and sat down in the day room where the TV is and watched the police, watched the police gangster pictures and saw uh, the people who are in prison cheer the police when they come upon the scene. I mean, it's a mind-blowing thing. Here are prisoners cheering the police. Uh, anybody who's ever had the experience of black people telling us uh, while we're doing work that, I don't want to hear none of that black stuff. Uh, sometimes it's hard for people to love themselves. It's hard to love yourself when you recognize and when you cannot get around the understanding that you ought to be taking care of yourself and doing for yourself, but you're not, and that somebody is taking care of themselves at your expense. It's hard to love yourself when you know Desi Woods is locked down for nothing because of the politics, because of the colonialist ideology within this country, and you can't free her. 
It's hard to love yourself when you know that Geronimo Pratt and Sundiata Akoli and Asada Shakur and Graham and Allen have no reasons for being in these prisons and they're there. And you have to look at your wife and your husband every day. It's hard to be able to rise to do it and it's hard to love yourself. And then you live in a country such as this country or such as any capitalist country in the world where there are no such things as unfettered human relations where human relations, just as any other situation in the world, are shaped and defined by the kind of production process that goes on, where everything has a price, even love. Because you don't love me because I gave you this much love yesterday and you only gave me this much love today. Everything has a price. Everything is measured in terms of quantity. All of our relationships are affected that way so that they take on <clears throat> the character of things even human relations. And we can say things, we can even say commodities. <clears throat> so it's necessary to talk about love a little bit because that's part of the reason why we are here and we do the things that we do. We do them in part because we love ourselves. This was the fantastic discovery that a lot of people who are here right now made in 1966. That it was all right with us to love ourselves. That was the thing that made black is beautiful such an energizing slogan when it should not have meant too much because everybody black should have understood that black was beautiful. But everybody didn't understand that because the whole world defined it as grotesque and not beautiful. We first love ourselves. It's loving ourselves that, make it, that makes it possible to struggle. It's self-love that makes it possible for people to come together to acquire the things that we need to exist in the world. If human beings did not love ourselves, we wouldn't do that and our species would not be on the face of the earth today. There would be no human species, but it is our self-love that motivates human beings to plow the earth, to grow something to eat, to cut down the tree, to make a shelter, to chase animals, and, and uh, to take the pelt to cover our bodies. It was out of self-love that we did that and developed our use of hands so that we could do it better. And consequent to that, even the use of speech and the capacity to have rational thought to express things with each other. If we didn't love each other, if we didn't love ourselves, the species would not be on the face of the earth. We wouldn't have chased the rabbit to eat. We wouldn't have done any of the things which uh, were demanded if we were going to survive. It's that fact, in part, this self-love that acts as a kind of motive force in history because it's while we, we are in the process of acquiring those things uh, which are necessary for us uh, that we develop techni techniques, that we develop techniques so that we now uh, don't just cut down a tree to make a lean to to protect ourselves from the elements, um, but we have construction companies, we have machines, as I say, there are machines, uh, which make it possible to, uh, for those things to be done. So uh, in a fashion, self-love is obviously responsible for that. You know, there are some people, there are at, at different times some forces uh, which were almost exterminated because <clears throat> their own love for self was not great enough <clears throat> to resist uh, not only their natural uh, elements but various other forces in the world which were destroying human life. We are still here and in great numbers and we are going to be here in great numbers going to free ourselves to the extent we learn <clears throat> that it's all right to love ourselves. When we talk about love, we also have to talk about human consciousness because consciousness is one of the things which distinguishes us as human beings from other animals. <clears throat> you know, if you left out the capacity for emotions, <clears throat> there's not much that distinguishes human beings from any other animal. But it is, in, is consciousness that helps us to make that distinction. And it is consciousness which makes such a unique thing as human relations. All animals have relations and human beings have the same relations that many other animals have in life. But there are some relations which are peculiar, which only human beings can have because in, in human relations there is, there is love and a capacity to love. All animals must copulate if the species is going to continue, but only human animals can have a love relationship because that presupposes consciousness. Only human animals can 
have a love uh, relationship because it is that love relationship that makes a difference in the recreation or reproduction of the species by other animals and, and, and human beings. It is that love, uh, that capacity uh, to have a love relationship that makes it absolutely necessary for us to struggle and free ourselves. I think uh, we may have you know, more clarity uh, today around the capacity of other animals um, to, to uh, experience uh, some of the emotions that we are talking about here. I mean, we know that uh, we've seen that in, in, in some animals like elephants and, and, and prim uh, primates and other things. We've seen that. We've seen um, um, you know, people mourn the loss of, uh, of, of, uh, of their children. That is, say, people, we, animals, other animals mourn that and, the, and the, uh, the loss of their mates and stuff like that. Uh, and actually retaliate uh, on human beings for doing horrible things to them. So we understand that a bit better, but uh, regardless the position, the point that we want to make here about uh, the significance of love, uh, and uh, even as it's attached to what we would characterize as human consciousness, uh, continues to uh, prevail. There are such things as consciousness and love. That is important for us to understand because when we consider, when we are conscious lovers, we unite that theory, that emotion, that abstract thing called love uh, with the things that we do. We don't just love in the abstract. How, can, how many times have you heard somebody say, you can't, you can't be loving me, not the way you carry on, right? You can't love me. Um, uh, we know people who say, uh, I love you. Uh, here in the US, people talk all the time about democracy and human rights, but you and I, are, as conscious human beings, know that it is a lie because there's a difference in what the U.S. articulates and what it does. The same thing, of course, is true with conscious love. If you, if you love for real, then you do certain kinds of things which are manifestations of that love. Uh, you, don't, you can't love somebody on the one hand and then bust them in the eye every day on the other hand. Uh, although I know someone who said, you can't love me because you never hit me. But that's the confusion. That's the way sometimes the conditions that we are faced with in this world today distort uh, our understanding of what is real, uh, what is necessary. It's important for us to talk here about love and conscious love, especially the people who are in here, because when we talk about love for the people, we are making a distinction between love for the people and love for ourselves uh, as individuals. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's extremely important. And well, we'll say some things uh, moving forward around that, uh, kinds of examples that we need to look at in order to come to, uh, uh, I think, a revolutionary perspective of, of love and what love is about. I mean, uh, Che Guevara made that statement um, to the effect that, um, uh, that uh, revolutionaries are motivated by great feelings of love. And I, I remember, uh, uh, I spoke at Oxford 55 years after Malcolm X spoke there. He spoke there December 3rd, 1964. And I read uh, recently, uh, prior to going to Oxford, uh, that Malcolm X um, uh, was asked by one of the people, one of the students uh, from, the, from the Oxford Union, of what he saw in terms of the future. And Malcolm X said that uh, I expect to be dead. I, they're going, I'm going to be killed. I mean, how in the hell can he make that statement? How can he go to Oxford, make the incredible presentation he made at Oxford, and then make the statement that I'm going to be killed uh, and, and still have, do what the hell he was doing? I mean, it really takes a, a commitment and love for the people. Otherwise, he could have gone home. He could have gone someplace else. He could have quit. He could have bowed out of the situation, but he didn't. And then people who didn't love uh, the people, didn't love the revolution, were able to work with, uh, with an enemy uh, government state, an uh, enemy power who was, was, um, that was also impressed by Mar Malcolm X, just as the Oxford Union was impressed by Malcolm X, and killed him. Uh, you know, there is love and there's love. I mean, we uh, sometimes uh, we look at Martin Luther King. Anybody who uh, saw Martin Luther King speak, I think it was the night before uh, he was killed. I knew that Martin Luther King knew that he was going to be killed. They had been threatening him. They had even sent 
uh, uh, messages and tapes uh, telling him to commit suicide and things like that. Uh, and there was no doubt, but he was able to say, you know, uh, I've been to the mountaintop, right? And I've looked across and say, and, I'm, and, he, and I saw freedom, and I, I may not get there with you, I may not get there with you, but I know that my people, that we as a people will be free. I mean, that's the kind of love that we are talking about in the face of even recognizing that he would die. I, I remember uh, watching the movie, some of you may have seen it, of uh, Patrice Lumumba. And uh, uh, who died an extremely early death, subsequent to having uh, been elected uh, in this bourgeois uh, farce that the Belgians had created, along with the United States and other forces that was designed to transfer the appearance of power uh, to uh, uh, a white power in a black face, but, but Lumumba was determined that it would be black power in the black face and not white power in the black face. And uh, so Lumumba had been, had, his government had been overthrown. He had escaped from a detention. Uh, then this detention that he was uh, put in uh, was ordered uh, by the Belgians and other forces, but they used uh, Africans who, in Congo, uh, like Mobutu, who had actually been appointed as uh, uh, the head of the military by Lumumba, uh, betrayed the revolution because he did not love the people as, as Lumumba loved the people. And so Lumumba escapes from detention and uh, after escaping, he's traveling uh, uh, through Congo, trying to get uh, to, uh, to uh, the, the, his, home, his home region. Uh, and as he's going, he's, he's stopping, he's speaking to, uh, to crowds of people who, uh, through every community, every village that they would go through. And of course, the, the, with the CIA's help, Mobutu and the troops were able to find, to see where he was. And he got to this place right before uh, the, the neo-colonial troops, co Congolese troops, uh, uh, had arrived. And uh, he was um, on this boat. And they were uh, going across uh, this, uh, this waterway. And uh, he had left his wife and child, or two, on the other side. And as he almost got across uh, uh, this waterway, uh, he saw his, he looked back and saw his children and his wife, and the soldiers had got there, and he said, stop, let's go back. And his comrades in the boat said, no, Patrice, you can't go back. And the people in the movie who was watching this were saying, don't go, don't do it. Even though they knew the story, they knew that Lumumba would die and it would happen, but they're saying, don't go. Now, the people were saying, don't go, not because they didn't think that Lumumba should love his wife and children, but they thought that the love of Congo, the love of Africa, the love of the revolution, the love of freedom, the love of liberation should be the thing that determined that decision that he made. And of course, Patrice Lumumba did turn back, uh, convinced that he could talk the soldiers into acting right, and et cetera, and he was captured. And Lumumba uh, was captured, uh, he, was, he was brutally beaten Brutally, I mean brutally beaten. It would be hard to describe uh, to you what they did to Patrice Lumumba. And, uh, and they killed him, and they, and they killed him, and they butchered him. As you say, they cut him up in pieces. Uh, they burned his body. They put it in acid uh, after they did all of those things. And they did all those bad things to Lumumba. But the question is, what did turning back mean for the revolutionary project. And this is a question that everybody, you know, needs to be able to ask, you know, um, would you have turned back? And was it a good choice to have turned back? And what, 
where would we be in terms of the revolutionary movement today if Lumumba hadn't turned back? The fact is that we're still struggling in Congo today uh, uh, because that thing did not get resolved. And of course, Lumumba could not have done it by himself. Uh, but which was the greatest expression, the greater expression of love? Uh, which would have been the greater expression of love? Turning back uh, for his wife and two children or going forward for Africa and for the revolution in Congo? These are the kinds of questions we're confronted with. And because we, we really do confront these questions, people have the ability to say, see, love for self in the world is a thing that allows us to love others who are like us. Without that, we can't love others who are like us. And that is true. I mean, um, if especially it is true for Africans, and perhaps it has been true uh, for other persons, uh, people who have lived under similar circumstances. But this has been an extraordinary thing and continues to be an extraordinary thing for Africans, even as we have this discussion. Because uh, that's what Malcolm X and Marcus Garvey would talk about. You can't if you hate the roots of the tree, you can't love the tree itself. You can't love the tree. And uh, what that means also in a practical way is that if you are filled with self-hatred, you can't love your mama, you can't love your mate or anything else. In fact, you, uh, you feel a certain kind of contempt for them because something must be wrong with them because they love you. And you know that you're worthless. This is, this is what it is to be like uh, live on the... Uh, colonial domination for African people everywhere throughout the communities that we work and, and struggle in and throughout the world. Yeah, and in fact, many of us can only be affirmed by appreciation uh, by white people, white power, etc. So, but love for ourselves does not necessarily mean love ourselves only. There is a distinction. And we have to remind ourselves of that a lot of times because to love ourselves allows us simply to find ourselves all the time pursuing our individual interests or what appears to be our individual interests. But love of self, which is the same thing as love for all the people and those who are like us, makes it necessary to struggle for ourselves and the people, those of us who are conscious. There is a distinction for example, women are oppressed in the real world by black men. I'm not quibbling with the power of black men, black people to oppress because I believe that a left hook in the jaw hurts. I really believe that it is oppressive. I believe that it is oppressive to misuse human beings even if you are a second-rate oppressor, even if you are an underdog oppressor, even if you are a very weak oppressor. I believe oppression is bad and women are oppressed. Black women are oppressed by black men. That's right, women are oppressed by black men. men. That's a general tendency that happens, generally in situations where people are not politically conscious of where, and, and where people don't understand phenomena that are happening to us in the world. Sometimes it happens with those of us who do understand phenomena and what is happening in the world. As a general tendency, black women are oppressed, and, that, and, and in that relationship, black men play an oppressive role generally as a tendency. I mean, you might even call it a neo uh, kind of oppression. It might be a substitute oppression, but uh, the fact, it happens. I mean, and there's, there's the data and statistics that show it, that we become employees. In fact, uh, I can say that about women, but you know, I remember you know, as a child uh, growing up, uh, my mother and I had a very uh, contentious relationship as a, as a small child because uh, I, I was born at a certain moment in history uh, where uh, not being conscious of it, of it myself, but experiencing the fact that uh, oppressed people around the world were rising up and fighting back. This was happening in the world. I was born in 1941, 1947. India is independent, 1949. China becomes independent. Struggles happening with national liberation everywhere. I was curious. I was from another generation than my parents. My, my father, whose parents, I think, were sharecroppers and what like, and had come to Florida, and I was of another generation that was aspiring uh, uh, for other things, and, and that was contemptuous of the kind of past and relationship. I, I grew up in a house 
uh, in a neighborhood where uh, 20 year old and white insurance guys would just come to your house and walk in the damn door without saying anything until I was home and would confront them about that. And this was just a reality that white people did, took it for granted, all kinds of things like that. So uh, uh, my mother loved me very much. Uh, but uh, from my perspective, she had a very strange way of demonstrating it. Uh, because I was always on the move. I was always out of place. Uh, and it was very dangerous for African young men to be out of place. You had to be in place. And so uh, I was never home. Uh, when my mother arrived uh, from work and I was supposed to be home, where is he? <laughs> I mean, I wasn't engaged in banditry or anything like that. I was just someplace else, doing something else. And uh, and every time I would do this, my mother would, would, would brutalize me. And she would say things like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat it out you before the white man gets you. And she became a substitute slave master. She became the substitute. She was going to tame me so that, that I could stay alive. That's how she saw herself as functioning. But that really, that really blew our relationship. I mean, that, that distorted our relationship in a very horrible way, even though I know what was at work. I know, you know, that it, this, that was what you might call, what do you call it, a love lick or something to that effect. I know that's what it was motivated by, trying to keep me alive because my mama knew what white people would do, especially to black men, especially young black. I knew it. I'm walking down the streets and being stopped by the police and, uh, 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 and then reading the newspapers and seeing lynches happen. I knew also. My, now, my boogeyman when I was growing up was the Ku Klux Klan. This come in, got to be in because there are these white people, you know, uh, who terrorize our people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I knew it. But the point is that this, our relationship is distorted. This is, this is an expression of love beating me. But she told me many years later that I just didn't understand. And, uh, and she didn't. So, uh, and I'm saying now something about the relationship that exists between African men and women. It's an unnatural relationship. That's part of what it is. That's part of the point. It's an unnatural relationship. And uh, 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 I don't know how many of you would have read the book A Native Son by Richard Wright, which is an extraordinary book. Uh, Richard Wright was really important in my own terms of my own development, reading his stuff. Because uh, he, you know, he understood black men, I think, perhaps better than anybody in the whole world. But there's this, this story of uh, Native Son, and, and the protagonist, his name is Bigger Thomas, I think it was. And he was a young African. He lived in Chicago and uh, couldn't get any money, couldn't get any dignity, and so Bigger and some of his friends had planned to rob this white man in a store in the neighborhood to get some money. And uh, that's a terrifying thing to rob the white man. And so what happened was that uh, they were to meet at this pool hall to go and do uh, the robbery. But when they got there, Bigger, uh, not wanting to do it, picked a fight with one of the persons he, with, that he was supposed to go and rob the, the white guy with. He couldn't say, I'm afraid to rob the white guy, right? So he took it out. He took it out on his friend. I mean, they had a very you know, uh, bad scene, a confrontation, because Bigger did not want to rob that white man. And I think our, our lives are like that as, co as colonized people. We know who the oppressor is. We know the kind of stuff that happens to us on a daily basis, but we know it's a deadly oppressor, armed to the teeth, willing to do anything to kill us, to kill our children, our parents, to bomb our houses and things like that. In fact, people have, won't even come to a meeting sometime because they think the white man will bomb our meeting. That's the reality that we are confronted with. So it's easier to pick a fight with each other than it is to deal with the white man. And that's what we find happening in the lives of colonized people and in the lives of our folk. This is why Jesus, Yahshua, to the extent that anything you read there can be believed, uh, uh, we know that, that Rome uh, dominated uh, uh, the people there. 
this is why he was saying, uh, love thy enemy as thyself. He wasn't talking about the damn Romans. And the reason you know he wasn't talking about the Romans because he said another place when he's sending his, his followers out, his organizers out, he says, don't go to the Gentiles. Uh, don't go uh, to the, what is the other group? Uh, Pharisees, not the Pharisees, but the um, Samaritans. You know, just go and, and talk uh, to the damn Hebrews. And so when he says, love thy, thy, turn the other cheek, he's talking about to each other. He's talking about all of us who engage in this struggle against the Romans. That's who he's talking to because they live in the colonial domination and colonialism affects people a, a certain way. And you will see it the same throughout history, up and down the line, throughout different places in the world. That's how it articulates itself. And so people have these distorted relationships with each other. No. So, uh, so that doesn't mean we are conscious oppressors, talking about what African men do. That is to say that the men, that is uh, to say that the men got together and had a meeting and say, look, let's take on the sisters. In fact, it is our consciousness that allows us to change our relationship to black women. And so as a consequence of the kind of oppression which happens to black women, they respond fiercely, especially in this period. And it's good to see fierce response to oppression. But when you are not conscious, your response is not necessarily the correct response. When I say the correct response, I'm talking about the response in the interest of black people. And we have to talk about the interests of black people because if we have a situation where black men and black women, for example, do not have a good relationship, then we, have, we don't have to worry about what the Carter administration or what any of our imperialist enemies are going to do to us because the species will die out. Without that relationship, there will be no black people. We can commit national suicide, so to speak. So obviously, since there must be black people and since we do love self and want black people to continue to exist and since we are conscious, then our response as conscious revolutionaries is to resolve the contradictions that exist between black men and women, even if all the black women and black men in the country or in the world are backwards and do not have minimum consciousness. Because now, as a conscious people or women or it is in the interest of gay people, or it is in the interest of this or that. But if we uh, struggle for all the people, then we mean we sh then that means we struggle for the women, for the men, for the babies, for the gays, for everybody who is black and oppressed and must be liberated. And that's the difference. So sometimes we we seek individual solutions in an attempt to respond. We always try to respond to a phenomenon in the world, but depending on whether uh, or not we are conscious, we will respond correctly, and that response will reveal the love that we have for ourselves. Another response would be to say, uh, to give up, uh, 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 say an incorrect response. Say in this instance again, the oppression of women, I just don't mess with no more dudes. I just won't have nothing to do with black men. They can go their way and I can go my way, unquote. We know that is an incorrect response. We don't have to be very clever to know that's an incorrect response. Because it's a different response, for example, that we would give if we knew there was food at the other end of this hall and we were hungry and there were all kinds of things were, that were in the way for us to get the food. We know if we don't get the food, we will die uh, so long as the food stays over there and we stay over here. So all alligators, gorillas, bears, all the policemen, everything got to be confronted and gotten around to get to the food. We do that because we want to live, because we love ourselves. If we do not rectify the relationship with black men and black women, we will die. Uh, there will be no more black people. So we know that is correct. So we have to resolve the contradictions among ourselves and among the people. There has to be a relationship, we say, in the party between seeing and doing, between thinking and acting. It's not good enough to say a thing and, and think a thing, uh, or think a thing. It is, it's important enough for us to, in this room to talk about it, about love, because the people in this room are people who have made some of the greatest sacrifices, the great sacrifices over long periods of time. There must be a relationship between seeing and doing and thinking and being. Furthermore, 
Uh, furthermore, so when we talk about love, it is important to us because we made a lot of sacrifices and sometimes we get tired. It's easy to get tired. Then for several years, I decide I'm going to do this for me. I'm owed this one or I can do this one for me, even to the extent of neglecting the people's work. That, of course, is not evidence of love of self. Not really. We have to talk about what genuine love is to this particular group because the manifestation of our love is the creation of the African People's Socialist Party as an instrument that's going to make us free. We know that the people need liberation and have to be free. Genuine love expressed by us means that we do not allow things to slide for the sake of peace because when we do that, our organizations are infiltrated, aren't they? We get all kinds of persons into the organization who are not going to work, that is going to, uh, going to uh, be, be necessary uh, to free the people. We don't learn to move forward, uh, which means that we are not truly about genuine love for the people because love for the people demands we struggle fiercely in the fight to liberate the people. Genuine love for the people means that we continue to express that love through the apparatus that we know can lead the struggle to liberate the people. It does not allow us to do things like uh, be so sympathetic that crazy people can occupy our dwellings or people who appear to be crazy are left there using the excuse that we love black people, therefore this crazy person here uh, didn't have any place to stay. Therefore, we brought this crazy person and let him stay in the house while all the revolutionaries are staying who are going to free all the people with us. That's not love for the people. This is, uh, that is not an expression of love for the people. Genuine love for the people will free the people. <laughs> love for ourselves cannot be so prideful that we cannot admit that we make errors and that we cannot say, I was wrong, I made an error. How do I rectify it and move forward? I mean, that's genuine love for the people. As Ho Chi Minh said, uh, there's nothing more precious than freedom and independence. Because that's what we want the people to have. Because we have a genuine love for the people. A genuine love for the people means that we don't allow things to get in the way of our expression of that love for the people. We don't allow anything to get in the way of the people's instruments for liberation uh, of the people. Genuine love uh, of the people also does not allow us to stand on the wayside and yell from afar. We got a lot of people who stand on the wayside and yell from afar. They may never hook up with anything. They just have opinions about everything. They stand back and tell you, you're moving wrong, you're moving right, you're moving wrong, straighten up there, you're out of step, etc. But genuine love for the people means we do right. We hook up with the party and the revolution. We bring our understandings and experience to it and we push the process forward to liberate our people. We don't quit. We get tired, but we don't quit. And Krumah said, the gorilla fails only when he surrenders. But genuine love means that we don't quit. We don't even have the capacity to quit because we love ourselves and we push forward. So I wanted to talk about love a little bit because we need to talk about love because black people are probably some of the most, probably the most unloved people on the face of the earth. I know we're the most unloved people on the face of the earth because we're the most oppressed people on the face of the earth. Now our enemies may not be motivated to oppress us because they do not love us, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the motive force of our oppression is the absence of love for us, but their ability to oppress us is surely determined by their ability to hate us and not love us. So we need to talk about love a lot among ourselves. And when we talk about love, we have to be very clear. Sometimes we say we have to love everybody. And that, of course, does not make any sense anywhere on the face of the earth. Sometimes we run into a lot of that. There are uh, some idealistic and metaphysical uh, people in the community who tell us that we cannot take a stand for black people because to take a stand for black people somehow means we're making an offensive against everyone else. Or some people will say even though we can identify certain forces as killers and murderers and oppressors of our people, we are supposed to love them too. We reject that and all of us reject that. We reject that out of, out of self-love. If we know, for example, that there are murderers in our midst and we know there are murderers about us or people who are taking our lives away. It is our love for ourselves and for our people that we do something about that to rectify that. 
We should have no problem with that. To love ourselves does not presuppose hating everybody else. But it's all right to hate somebody else too. It's all right to hate the people who are responsible for the starvation and the rickets and the executions on the streets and in our communities and, and theft of our mother country, uh, the enslavement of our people. It's all right to hate them. I would like for people who are present tonight to join with me in hating our enemies. And like I said, there must be a relationship between thinking and doing, hating our enemies and moving toward the destruction of our enemies. When I say destruction, I would like to be absolutely emphatic. I do not mean praying for their early demise. Hating our enemies means that we put forward programs to bring about their timely destruction, their conscious timely destruction. I would like the people to join with me in hating our enemies and loving our people and strike a thousand blows. Pamberene Chimboringa, Pamberene APSP, September 1, 1978, APSP Conference Banquet, Atlanta, Georgia. Uhuru. So, let's talk about love. <laughs> uh, so, Comrade Akile, I also, I just want to, uh, as we prepare to uh, deepen this discussion, uh, I just want to remind everybody that we are uh, involved with the Black Power 96 uh, radio station, FM radio station, uh, in a fundraising drive, and it is this radio station that makes it possible for us to be speaking to a lot of people uh, today, this morning. And even those of you who are not uh, participating in this meeting through Black Power 96 are encouraged uh, to make contributions to this radio station. It's important uh, to the Africans uh, here in St. Petersburg, Florida, but it's important to our movement and our struggle everywhere. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there is an app that allows uh, people to uh, all around the world uh, to listen to Black Power uh, 96.3 uh, FM. And the, the fundraising goal uh, for the month of February is $7,000. And uh, for us, that's a lot of money. Uh, but we know you are rich. Uh, so we, uh, if you got the seven grand that you can send us, send it on now, and we will not hound you uh, as much. Uh, uh, but uh, this, this, uh, that we are doing now, O'Malley Taught Me uh, show uh, has the responsibility to raise $2,000. And uh, I'm calling on everybody uh, to participate uh, in making contributions. And you can go to blackpower96.org slash donate. That's blackpower96.org slash donate. You can call 1-888-979-BP96. Uh, that's Black Power 96 or 1-888-979-2796. And uh, let us know your pledge in the chat, chat on, on YouTube or on Facebook. And uh, when you donate, you get a membership card, and we'll include some Black Power 96 swag depending on your membership level. And so for the first uh, five people who donate at the Marcus Garvey level, which is 296 and up, or $25 a month, we're offering a signed copy of uh, the forthcoming book, uh, Vanguard, The Advanced Attachment of the African Revolution, uh, that uh, I wrote uh, for uh, the Seventh Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. Uhuru. Uh -huh. Yeah. Let's salute our leadership, Chairman Malayasha Tella, for that brilliant study this morning. Uhuru, Chairman. And I want to say that somebody already claimed one of the five uh, Vanguard books, became a Marcus Garvey level uh, sustainer, and that was me uh, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Right> uh, <laughs> right. so there's four left. As Chairman said, you get a signed copy of Vanguard, which is the um, political report to the Seventh Congress that Chairman just wrote. It'll be uh, released at the end of this month. So if you become a Marcus Garvey level sustainer of blackpar96.org, you can receive a free signed copy of that book. So go ahead and just, you know, go ahead and say you're going to pay $25 every month to support the radio station. And um, I really want to appreciate Chairman uh, for this study. I think it was just a very brilliant piece written in 1978, but obviously still, you know, just the line and everything that the party has done has always been consistent and it's relevant uh, for us today as African people come into revolutionary life, um, you know, raise revolutionary consciousness and um, try in this process to repair the relationships that have been damaged as a result of being um, colonized subjects. 
And <clears throat> as I stated earlier, you know, show your love by donating to blackpart96.org. You go to blackpart96.org slash donate and um, keep the station on the airwaves. You know, make, make sure that this study, like O'Malley Taught Me Sunday study, can get out to not just the local African community here in St. Petersburg, Florida, but around the world. There's no radio station on the planet like it, and you're not going to hear the speeches of Chairman O'Malley, I should tell, on any other radio station. It's gonna be right here. You hear O'Malley Taught Me Sunday studies on Black Power 96.3, which is why you need to go and donate right now. And so far, um, O'Malley Taught Me Sunday Studies has a $2,000 um, goal for the $7,000 goal. So $2,000 for O'Malley Taught Me Sunday Studies. So if this is your favorite show on Black Pro 96, you need to show up and show out and donate um, to, right now for the $2,000 that um, O'Malley Taught Me has to the $7,000 goal for BP96. And uh, for O'Malley Taught Me, People who have donated already, we have uh, myself, so that's $125 um, to Amali Taught Me Sunday Study. We have Kobina, Comrade Kobina, who's a Southern Regional Representative of the APSP out in Huntsville, Alabama, um, home of Zinzale Consignment. And uh, Kobina has contributed $20 today to the radio station, so Huru Kobina. We had um, Janice, who donated $50. Um, she became a Bob Bar Janice Kent from St. Petersburg, Florida, $50, and um, who became a Bob Marley sustainer. And we have uh, Comrade Sandy from Seattle, who donated $100, and uh, Lisa from Minia Minia Minneapolis, who donated $100. So that totals us right now to $320 um, raised for a Molly Taught Me Sunday study. That means that we have 1680 to go, and I believe that we can make it. Um, Chairman, you know, already said if we can do it, you know, today, let's go ahead and do it today. Let's not wait all month. Again, if this is your favorite show, you need to show up and show out and uh, send in those donations. But I do want to go ahead and open it up for any questions um, or comments, and I'm trying to flip back and forth to the live. <clears throat> to see if there is anything. I know I just want to recognize some people who are tuning in, which includes um, Comrade Mkask um, from Kenya and Comrade, Comrade Kwame from Ghana, um, who are on, who are watching with us right now, and also Comrade S.G. Louese, um, who is in London, uh, Secretary General of the African Socialist International. So I wanted to acknowledge our comrades who are tuning in um, from around the world. And before I can find any questions on the live, is there any questions or comments um, in the hall today? Um, that would like to address Chairman. No? Okay. All right. Well, I have to keep looking for. Oh. Okay. Have to keep looking for um, comments and discussion. Oh, and uh, Kenya is on. Kenya is on, yes. <laughs> oh, she says, Chairman, as your daughter, I appreciate this discussion. It is important to understand that re what real love is. My question, will you expand more about why loving everyone um, discussion is the way, why loving everyone discussion is a way to keep us distracted? Oh, well, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, in, the, in the 1960s, I think it was SNCC that uh, came up with the song, uh, Too Much Love. Actually, it was a popular song at the time. It was Too Much Love, Too Much Love, something. And But SNCC, you know, uh, Too Much Love, Too Much Love, Nothing Kills the like too much love, right? And it's because um, what this concept does is uh, uh, obscure uh, the reality uh, that uh, Africans are oppressed, that we are an oppressed people, an oppressed nation. And for there to be uh, an oppressed people, there must be an oppressor. One cannot oppress oneself. And uh, that uh, this is something that's been really promoted uh, by uh, the colonial white power, that we love everybody, you have to love everybody. In fact, you, you hear it expressed in, in different ways even today about this thing, you have to love everybody, you can't hate. That's why you know, Obama became the noble Negro because he wasn't upset, and Mandela the noble Negro, they weren't upset with anybody. And I said, there's something wrong with those Negroes. Uh, because uh, you need to be upset with the killers, the oppressors, uh, unless you're the killer or the oppressor yourself. So uh, this, this whole thing about, and it's sort of like humanism, you know, that we're all human, uh, et cetera. But yeah, we're all human beings. But uh, the fact is that there are oppressors and they are the oppressed. There are exploiters and there are those who are exploited. And the exploited and the oppressed 
must have uh, the weapon, the emotional weapon, tool, if you will, to be able to hate oppression, hate oppressors, uh, hate exploit, uh, exploitation, and hate those who uh, are responsible and, uh, for exploitation. So this movement uh, that was always present uh, uh, among uh, the Hebrews, uh, f ongoing fight. Uh, Yeshua was not the only one who claimed to be uh, some kind of Messiah, some kind of deliverer, uh, who actually, not the only one who actually ran around doing miracles and things like that. Uh, uh, but this was a resistance movement against the Romans. And they were talking about, when they talked about founding a kingdom uh, on earth, they were talking about a, literally being able to liberate themselves, to become a free people. And that's what that, that whole movement was about. And that's what motivated this whole thing of love, because uh, obviously everybody did not engage in that love. There were people who, uh, uh, among the Hebrews, there were Sadducees and, and uh, Pharaoh, uh, uh, Pharisees and things like that, uh, that had a particular relationship with, uh, with white power. Uh, and I'm saying white power because obviously the Romans would have been the only white people in, in this area, since you're talking about a location that's uh, crosswords between Africa and Asia, clearly this was not a natural domain for the white people. The Romans uh, would have been the only white people as such uh, that were there. And uh, uh, they were oppressive, uh, exploitative, and they had certain sectors of the population that collaborated with them, dominating us. Uh, and we faced the same thing as colonized people here and everywhere around the world. A colonial oppressor uh, could not be uh, effective, uh, certainly as effective without uh, collaboration from a certain sector of the colonized. Today we recognize that as neo-colonialism. Uh, and there's a whole class, a whole social force that owes its existence to its relationship uh, to this imperial power. Thank you, Kenya. Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman, and um, want to unite with what you put forth and also appreciate um, in the beginning where it talked about how, you know, because in regards to like the story about um, your children and everything like that, about how revolutionaries, you know, we express our love by fighting for the, fu the future of our, of our people and that there is no greater expression and um, that some people will, um, and some people, you know, say this because there's this whole uh, politic about, you know, how, you know, how could you um, do something like that? How could you abandon your children? Um, with, and this whole idea that, you know, like something like, you know, how could you put your family? F I mean, how couldn't you not put your family first? How could you not, um, you know, even put your own self first? Love yourself and your own self care and all this kind of, you know, uh, BS. And that's not. The re that's not how you express uh, genuine love for the people and the people that um, you even, you know, care for around you. So there's a whole, you know, a politic like that and something that, um, you know, we've been, it's just like an attack on the revolution and the revolutionaries um, for taking that stance, which is really the only, like, the only commendable stance you can take is furthering the revolution and understanding what that comes with. And like you said, that revolutionaries, you know, that, Anyway, yeah. You know, you, so. think about, uh, you know, you can have a great love poem writing slave on the plantation. I mean, just write wonderful love poems uh, uh, to uh, his wife, to uh, uh, his lover, her lover, and what have you. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's remarkable or good at all. I mean, in a way, what it does is accept its relationship with slavery. I, I think the best love poem you can find uh, is that written by David Walker, you know, who was talking about all of the enslaved African people rise up and kill the slave master and to make brutal war. That's a love poem for somebody who is enslaved, living under colonial domination. All this other stuff is uh, really uh, uh, a way of uh, uniting with slavery and trying to make slavery, make colonialism, make living under white domination, uh, uh, you know, something uh, that is normal, that we live with. And that's abnormal. It's ab slavery and colonialism are abnormal. It's abnormal. And you can't have a normal life 
under colonial domination. There's no way in hell. And sometimes there are people in our own movement and our party and our organization trying to find this normal life. And what happens is, whether they intend to or not, they create a stake in our own oppression. They create a stake in colonialism, a stake in imperialism. And what we need to do if there's a stake involved is take it and drive it in the heart of this vampire, this imperialist vampire that dominates the world. I think that's really um, something that uh, we have to understand. It's going to take a minute to understand this. This is why we even have uh, an African Martyrs Day. We've taken up the whole African Martyrs Day uh, because our oppressors would take jailing us and killing us and brutalizing us uh, as something that they use to intimidate the people, to make the people afraid to struggle, to afraid to resist. They set examples of us uh, in that fashion. And so, like we say, February 21st, 21st of this month. I mean, people are celebrating Valentine's Day, but I think the best Valentine's Day is February 21st, which is African Martyrs Day. That's the, that's the anniversary <laughs> of the murder of, of uh, Malcolm X. <coughs> and what we do is, is take that away from the oppressor. You can't use this murder of Malcolm X as something to intimidate us, to make us frightful. And what we do is we hail Malcolm X, this incredible martyr, and hold up any revolutionary, any African who has suffered martyrdom at the hands of our oppressor is something uh, to emulate as opposed to something that we would be afraid of. And so, you know, that's, that's love. And, uh, you know, that's love. That's love, yeah. Uh, and um, th throughout this discussion, we have a donation come in from Comrade Renee in St. Pete for $20. Uhuru right. Renee. Uhuru. Um, Comrade Sandy upped her pledge to become a Garvey sustainer. Um, so she gets a Vanguard book signed right by the chairman. Uhuru. And also, Marissa. Hold on. Oh. Hold on. Yes. That's Sandra Thompson who is being referenced there. And um, I wanted to stop there. Uh, because Sandra Tom Thompson is a white woman who is an African internationalist. And having embraced African internationalists has given her a great capacity for love and how to even direct that love. Sandra Thompson is somebody who, uh, up until relatively recently, and I hope I'm not invading too much um, your privacy, uh, suffered from a life-threatening disease. In, act in fact, uh, I think she thought, and I thought, uh, that she would be dying. But Sandra Thompson showed up every damn day to do this work, uh, to participate in the struggle, participate in this movement. And um, that was an expression of the kind of love that we are talking about. She never said that because I am going to die, I need to go someplace and live in some spa or just to take care of myself or something to that effect. She, as long as she was physically able uh, to participate, she did it. And um, so right on to Comrade Sandy. Live like Sandy, be like Sandy, you know, love like Sandy. Uhuru. And um, Comrade Marissa um, out in Seattle became a Marcus Garvey sustainer today. So right. she also claimed one of the Vanguard books. Right Uhuru. On. So. That means there are only two Vanguard books left for anybody to claim right now. If you become a Marcus Garvey Level Sustainer member at blackpart96.org slash donate, that's $25 a month. Really not a lot of money at all when you think about everything you line up to spend every month. You can be supporting the Black Power um, 96 radio station that has, you know, this show, Amali Tommy Sunday Study, which a show you'll never find anywhere else, right on our radio station. So support this show, support Black Pro 96, go to blackpro96.org slash donate, and be one of these last people to claim a free Vanguard book signed by our very own Chairman Amali Chatella. And we have Comrade Suchas, uh, who donated $50 today. Uhuru. Uhuru. And I'm still looking for more questions. <clears throat> Um, oh, uh, comrade, oh, did I already say that? Did I say? No, I don't think I did. Janice Kent upgraded her um, membership to a, upgraded her Marcus Garvey to a, I mean, upgraded her Bob Marley to a Marcus Garvey. So I believe that she claimed one of the Vanguard books. So that means there's only one left. Oh, Kitty, <laughs> Kitty Riley, currently in St. Petersburg, Florida. 
Oh, <laughs> she's trying. Okay, well, Kitty has claimed the last Vanguard book of uh, Huru that will be signed by the chairman uh, for donating to Black Planet 6 for becoming a Marcus Garvey level sustainer. So, Huru, so that's all the Vanguard books that we're offering this week, but. Black Pride 96 offers, you know, many amazing premium gifts for our donors, for our um, contributors to the radio station. So, as mentioned, there's a bunch of Black Pride 96 swag. We got fanny packs, t-shirts, lanyards, hats galore. So, you know, if you donate today, any one of those items can be yours. So go to blackpride96.org. So our new total is $615. So what's left for a Molly Taught Me Sunday study is $1385. So comrades, if we can raise $1,000 today, that means we only have $1,000 left for, the, um, for a Molly Taught Me Sunday study. We're at 615 right now by you guys just this morning. So, you know, really want to appreciate everybody who has donated thus far. Continue to donate. Um, again, blackpride96.org slash donate is your site. You want to go make those contributions. And <clears throat> we have, um, you know, a couple comments coming in from online. We have Grady Brown who's tuning in from St. Louis. Um, we have uh, Comrade Kota, who is in Philadelphia, says, so grateful for the study, Chairman's Leadership, and the Theory of African Internationalism. This analysis demystifies the abstract concept of love. Revolutionary love is the way forward. Uhuru. And, um, yeah, so that's all I'm seeing right now. Oh, uh, Comrade Deputy Chair Onazanea Shatella, who is... Um, well, the Deputy Chairwoman of the African People's Socialist Party and the President of the African People's Education and Defense Fund, who is actually, you know, the, who's over Black Pride 96.3 FM. So, Huru Deputy Chair, she says, there has to be a relationship, we say, in the party between saying and doing, between thinking and acting. African People's Education and Defense Fund would like to donate $1,000 to Black Pride 96 to support the only community radio station that supports the African working class and African people everywhere. I want to salute Director Akile Anai, Director of APSP Adjaprop, and our new station manager, Timba Shibanda, who puts the game, who puts the ground game in play every day. <laughs> Do we get a Vanguard book? Uhuru. <laughs> I think we can make an exception when they can get a Vanguard book. So Uhuru, that's $1,000 from APDF. Thank you, Deputy Chair Onizene Shitella. Uhuru. And like she said, there has to be a relationship. We say in the party between saying and doing. So we say we love Black Pride Six. We love this work, and that is, you know, shown materially through donating to Black Pride Six. But do not let um, this generous contribution stop any of you from, you know, helping us reach our overall goal this month. Uh, so that told us us for Omali taught me to 1685. So six. Yeah, $1,685 raised for Amali Taught Me. Again, we're trying to get to $2,000 for Amali Taught Me Sunday study. And we have a donation coming in from the African People's Solidarity Committee of $100. Uhuru. Uhuru. So that actually brings us to... Um, that actually brings us to 17... Oh, sorry. 1715... And then Comrade Chimaranga Salambao is pledging $25 on February 20th. Uhuru, Comrade Chimaranga. Uhuru. So that'll have to be a new total. <clears throat> I'm waiting on Lisa to get that to me. And all right, so, oh, wait, no. She didn't calculate the other one. OK, waiting on the new total. Uh, Lisa, don't forget to add the $25 that Comrade Chimaranga um, in St. Petersburg said that he would uh, pledge. <clears throat> All right, looking for some more uh, questions or comments. I see Comrade uh, M. Cast out of Kenya. She made, just made a comment. And, uh, oh, she did. I don't understand emojis, I think, what they're called. But oh, uh, do yeah, you yeah. See it? Do you see it um, there? I think I saw that a little bit earlier. Yeah. Where she said, is that the one where she says chairman? Our chairman gets it. Yeah, our chairman yeah. gets it. Yeah. Uhuru. And some little faces and. <laughs> 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 we have Virginia Wilson who donated five dollars today to Black Pride ninety six. Uhuru, Virginia. Uhuru. I wish I could clap better, but this is what I got right now. There's Ann Hirsch, who uh, just commented. Uh, she's in St. Petersburg, Florida, saying, "Destroy white power. So good to have a way to step off the pedestal of oppression." Uhuru. Yeah. 
And um, for anybody who wants to know the phone number on how to donate, it's 888-979-2796 or 888-979-BP96. That stands for Black Power. So um, go ahead. If you want to go on the website, blackpower96.org slash donate, you can even make uh, mail a check out. If you don't do the card thing, online thing, you can make a check out to Black Power 96 and mail that to 1245 18th Avenue South, St. Petersburg, Florida, 33705. Comrade Raya Fogarty says she will contribute $25 on March 3rd. Uhuru Raya. Uhuru. And um, Raya actually, um, well, Raya is another um, brilliant, you know, member of the African People's Solidarity Committee who has expressed genuine revolutionary love for the struggle um, for African people to be free and self-determining. And it's not this, you know, charity politic, it's not this whole idea of, you know, white people love, you know, white people, we love black people and all this kind of stuff, but it's a genuine stance and, you know, has been, you know, just through the, you know, through the fire, wind, and war, um, you know, to defend the, you know, the liberation movement and um, just taking a righteous stance of solidarity. And she says, parasitic colonial imperialist white power is the problem. African internationalism defines the, defines the way the white oppressor nation can rectify our vicious legacy and reparation, it, and its reparations to African people, Uhuru. So Uhuru Raya. And we have questions coming in from YouTube. Um, May I make first a comment yes. from uh, Comrade Chia uh, Kodosuka? Um, out of Philadelphia. Uh, so grateful for this study, Chairman's Leadership and the Theory of African Internationalism. This analysis demystifies the abstract concept of love. Revolutionary love uh, is the way forward. So that's from, from Kota. Thank you, um, you Yeah, there's a, there's a question on the YouTube and I don't quite understand how to phrase it. I don't know what they're trying to say, but I'll try my best. Because um, originally, it's, and this person's really, really Robinson on YouTube says, since slavery bred a child with a colonizer, are we, to are we to love as well within the revolution? And then David asked for clarification, are you asking if we should love mixed individuals as revolutionaries? And um, I guess that was his question. I really love mixed individuals. I mean, one of the things I really always appreciated, and, and even uh, petty bourgeois Africans uh, used to uh, uh, talk about when I was a child, is that uh, our community uh, has always accepted uh, Africans uh, no matter what, you know? Uh, like there's a whole thing in, in the white world where if one had one eighth of a percentage of white, of African blood, then one was a black person, one was black, characterized in that fashion. And we used to be so proud of the fact that uh, any African, anyone who was an African was accepted in our community, anybody who was an African. And I think that holds true today, uh, 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 should hold true. Uh, so uh, that would not be the question for us, whether or not someone had mixed parentage, especially you know, somebody, uh, especially or somebody uh, during this era of what he's talking about of uh, colonial slavery, uh, when African women had no choices. Uh. Hello, thank you. Here's Grady Brown, did you see his? Yes, I'm about to announce oh, okay. it now. Grady Brown out of St. Louis says he will contribute $20 on March 1st. Uhuru, Grady, Uhuru. <laughs> We have our comrade Diane Tournay out of Gainesville, Florida, who um, also is donating $20. So, Huru Diane. And we have Penny Hess, who's the chairwoman of the African People Solidarity Committee, contributing $25 to blackpro96.org. Uhuru. And again, you guys go to blackpro96.org slash donate. And our new total is, drum roll, da 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 da. $1,960, so we only have 40 more dollars to raise before we reach the $2,000 goal for Omali Taught Me Sunday Study. So who is it going to be? We have Comrade Jesse Neville, the chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, who's donating $20, Uhuru. So 
We only need 20 more dollars, comrades, brothers, and sisters. 20 more dollars, and Chairman will have succeeded in raising $2,000 for Black Pride 96.3 FM. But I'm going to ask for money next week, too. So. <laughs> anyone, anyone got the, extra, the last 20? Go ahead and make that contribution now and let you know we can and continue to continue to donate you know you can go beyond 40 40 left yes okay. sorry i know i'm bad at math but did you see him um seeing it i'm seeing it right now oh Who? there are two people there yes comrade k fing out of houston texas 20 dollars uhuru that's another comrade Another comrade, a veteran member of the African People's Socialist Party who has expressed tremendous love for African people with you know, his commitment and dedication to the party and the revolution. And who was at the banquet where this presentation was made? Mm. And there's some people who can't hang around for six months or, yes. or two years without abandoning the revolution, becoming, you know, the whatever. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Be like K-Fing. Yeah. Uhuru. Um, and we also have Comrade Kota, who pledges $20 on February 15th. Uhuru Kota, out in Philadelphia. Um, Uhuru Furniture Store and Collectibles, out there in Philadelphia. And we have um, Comrade Johan, with $10. Johan, and located in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uhuru. Keep it coming. We love it. Thank you so much. Continue to donate to blackfriendly6.org. And, you know, so we can reach this overall goal of $7,000 to keep the station on the airwaves. Um, you know, again, we are not paid by any big corporation. You know, no uh, Democratic Party, no Republican Party owns this station. This is a station for the people, by the people. It is, you know, funded by you. It has your voices on it. And you have music from Africans locally and all around the world, speeches of Chairman Amali Anshatel and other revolutionaries. Um, of our time and you know again no other station like you're not going to hear the voices of the African working class on it you know right here in the streets of St. Petersburg Florida to you know occupy Tanzania or South Africa um, you have comrade Mads of Uhuru Solidarity Movement out in Portland who's contributing twenty dollars today to Black Pride 96 Uhuru Uhuru this is I can't wait for this total um, Hold on, anything else? I see uh, Comrade Vince Lawrence is on. I'm glad to see him there. Vince Lawrence, uh, as you may know, he's, in, he's down uh, in Fort Myers, and he uh, was a founding member of the African People's Socialist Party. And I got to get back with you, Vince, to talk to you about some things. Uh, but yeah, he's been, he's been here. Yeah. Yes, and he was actually featured on several of Amali Taught Me Sunday studies um, that we have within the last uh, few months talking about the history of the African People's Socialist Party. So, Uhuru, Comrade Vince Lawrence. Um, so, our new total is $2,050. Uhuru! <laughs> Woo! We did it! I knew we could. Well, we did it. $2,050, again, keep it coming. We have a whole goal of $7,000 the, for the month of February to keep the station on the airwaves. We got Comrade Nadia, who's a Nord Northern Regional Representative of the African Socialist Party out in Philly, $25. So, Huru Nadia, Huru. And also, if you do have um, any questions in regards to the study today, Chairman just gave a brilliant study about African internationalism on love, what it means to love and be a revolutionary. And um, you know, it was just a really profound reading. Again, wrote this piece or gave a presentation in 1978 to talk about this question. And I just thought it was very, very important for all of us to hear to understand what it takes to be, you know, to be a revolutionary and the commitment that we have to make and how that is the, the highest expression of love that we could ever have. Um, also really want to appreciate you, Chairman, talking about like, you know, self-love and not the, not the way we know it now, but um, in regards to how we have to love ourselves and like we can't internalize self-hatred, um, it makes it impossible to love our people and so it's beyond just like us and you know, because if we hate ourselves and we think and we feel like we're worthless, which is something that colonialism makes us feel every day, um, you know, if we internalize that and stick with that, then it makes it impossible for us to love um, the people around us and just in general. So, <clears throat> 
Oh, uh, Lisa pointed out that Vince Lawrence is a supporting member already, so um, shout out to all of our current supporting and sustaining members of Black Power 96. And our new total currently is $2,075, so uhuru, and it's not over yet. Um, Did you count Bakre Olatunji oh. and um, Revisai? Uh, Bakre out of Oakland and Revisai uh, out of St. Louis? Uh, Bakri out of Oakland says he pledges $25 on this coming Wednesday. Uhuru, Bakri, Uhuru. <laughs> and we have Revisai who pledges $10 out of St. Louis. Uhuru, Revisai. <laughs> Uhuru. All right, so again, any other questions or comments? Anything from our live audience um, before we get into announcements? Um, Someone says, oh, um, Uhuru, this is on YouTube. Uhuru, thank you for this analysis into the emotional factors underlying our reality and our mission. Uh, can we do more to enhance the emotional health of our movement who often give so much without uh, much personal gain? That is from Langston in Boston. What was that again? I like that. Uh, can we do more to enhance the emotional health of our movement who often give so much without um, what they characterize as much personal gain? Yeah, that's, that's a really important question. And it's asked, uh, raised at different times in different ways. Uh, there are some people who are on a mission of self-healing. I mean, that's what they characterize that we have to heal, be healing. And I know organizations that are tied to this healing thing that Africans have to heal ourselves and, and, um, and people, you know, I think there are even certain kinds of industries that, you know, rising up about self-healing and about, you know, we have to heal ourselves. That's what they do all the time, uh, heal themselves. But what I appreciate, uh, and I've told uh, others this, I appreciate uh, uh, Franz Fanon, uh, who uh, was a psychiatrist and participated uh, in the Algerian Revolution. He was born um, uh, in the Car Caribbean islands. <coughs> and he said that the colonized can only be healed by killing the colonizer. And that, that's, that's the way, you know. Uh, and I remember, you know, the emotional distress that I lived with as a, as a young person, you know, especially in my teen years. And uh, Chimarang, you're probably too young to remember this, but uh, in my teen years, I, I was all kinds of distress. And it was, in, it was only after that I made a commitment to join the revolution. I literally mean this. I felt like a ton of weight <laughs> dropped off my shoulders when I knew that I was going to be doing the revolution. And uh, I think that the uh, way we engage in healing uh, is a bundle of burning spears uh, in um, um, a, a St. Louis winter uh, out uh, wherever we can find African people selling it, or any other circumstances. I think that's what healing is all about. It connects us to our people in a certain way, because looking for this individualized kind of healing, uh, it doesn't work. It's in relationship with the people and, uh, that we experience this healing, and, and, and the process of killing and plotting on the, on the colonizer and doing things to change our relationship to the colonizer uh, that's the thing that heals us. And Fanon said that um, when you kill the colonizer, uh, you kill two. You kill both the colonizer and the colonized. Do you see? That uh, it requires the existence of the colonizer for there to be a colonized. So, you know. Uh, see, the outcome of all the work it is that we put in, that is the gain um, to see the advancement, to see, you know, the being victorious, moving the revolutionary project forward. And that has to be seen as a gain, um, you know, not these other things, but this is the victory. And the gain is moving forward and uh, being victorious on all these fronts, which I think also helps um, to sum it up that way. Um, we have uh, Comrade Amanda in St. Pete uh, for $25, spot for 96. Imperial right. Amanda, thank you. And we have um, Dan, is it, I don't know if it's Ellie or Eli, and Rosie oh, in Minneapolis yes. with $30. I Uhuru. Know. Uhuru. Uhuru. And just 
doing some final rounds. May I read a comment? Yes, please. This is from Comrade Chia Kota. Uh, as we mentioned, she's in the furniture store in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, Kota, Comrade Kota, really, uh, I think, is Colombian. And uh, she writes, Uhuru, it is uh, the most profound, let me get it out. It is uh, the most profound honor to work under the leadership of the party, especially at one of its 20 plus economic development institutions. This movement has showed me what it means and what it takes to be a revolutionary. It's so humbling to be a part of this process. One of my favorite things the chairman has said is that in the process of transforming the world, we too become transformed. I love this movement for transforming me in such a way that I love myself and I love the people and nothing will ever deter me from expressing that love in a material way. Long live Chairman Omali Shetela, Deputy Chair, Ona Zene Ishetela, and the African People's Socialist Party, Uhuru in our lifetime. Uhuru. Uhuru Kota. Uhuru. And Comrade uh, Ann Hirsch, uh, Uhuru, uh, unite with this chairman, even white people. We can't heal within the system. It so clouds our thinking, our understanding, our relationships between nations and individuals. White power distorts it all. Indeed, uh, and, and indeed doing for the people of the world under the leadership uh, uh, of this revolutionary APSP power is what heals. And that's Comrade Ann Hirsch right here in St. Petersburg. And, um, oh, this is a friend of yours, Comrade, uh, you see it? This is from Comrade uh, uh, Dexter. Uh, hmm? Say it again. And the Mwangu. All right. Uh, um, out of Boston, Uhura, I just uh, really, uh, I, I just really want to appreciate Chairman's analysis on love and what love uh, truly means to look like for our people. Revolutionary love contrasts so much from the bourgeois love we're told to aspire toward. It differs so much from the love we find in the dictionary. I want to donate twenty dollars today to Black Power ninety six. Okay, that's another twenty dollars. Yeah. Splendid. Uhuru. And Uhuru. Comrade Ann also, I don't know if you said this one, but Comrade Ann also said she's donating $5 to Black Power oh, right Six. On. So Great. Uhuru. And I really want to appreciate everybody who uh, donated um, today. We are about to go into announcements, Chairman. I don't know if you are you good. All right. Thank you. All right. So again, really want to appreciate everybody who uh, donated, everybody who pledged. We will be following up to, with you to make sure that we uh, secure that pledge. And just appreciate everybody's um, showing love and support um, materially to Black Power 96.3 FM that you know can bring to you programming um, like Omalia Shatella, um, Omali Yashatella's um, Omali Taught Me Sunday Studies, and you know so much um, programming that we want to be able to you know expand, get out in the world. There's so much that we need to do to improve our station, and we can do it because of the people like you who contribute to it. So thank you all so much. Those who became a Marcus Garvey um, member today, um, who secured your Vanguard book, you can look forward to that towards the end of this month, beginning of March. You'll have a signed copy of Chairman Vanguard, the Advanced Attachment of the African Revolution, signed, and um, that is because you became a Marcus. Garvey uh, level sustainer at Black Power 96 and also again salute to Deputy Chair Ona Zanea Chitella and that tremendous contribution from the African People's Education and Defense Fund. Thank you so much for supporting Black Power 96.3 FM. <clears throat> and this study was brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, winning the war of ideas. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspear.com. For revolutionary radio, dynamic shows, and music by Africans all around the world, tune in to Black Power 96.3 FM, broadcasting out of St. Petersburg, Florida, and accessible via the Black Power 96 app for Apple and Android, or online at blackpower96.org. Did you unite with what you heard today and want to learn more about how you can get involved with the African People's Socialist Party? Visit APSPUhuru.org for all information regarding how you can apply. 
join the Freedom Mass Choir and Band. The Freedom Mass Choir and Band is an all African community group of singers and instrumentalists that sing songs of resistance and revolution. Members are located throughout the United States and attend weekly rehearsals both in person and via live stream and video. Sign up by emailing blackpowerchoir at gmail.com or call 727-537-6736. And we have a few announcements for Uhuru Foods and Pies. Uhuru Foods and Pies are selling delicious pies at the prestigious Mills College in Oakland. They are the concessionaire for Ubuntu Theater for four consecutive weekends beginning February 8th through March 3rd. They will also be hosting a webinar. Robert Allen used to teach at, uh, at Mills College. Robert Allen, he wrote Black Awakening oh. in Capitalist America, hmm. which is a really important oh. book that people should take a look at. Yeah. Yep, and Uhuru Foods and Pies will be out there. Yeah. And they will also be hosting a webinar entitled Black Community Control of Our Food, Uhuru Foods Leads the Way. On Tuesday, February 19th at 5 p.m. Pacific Time, broadcasting live from the Uhuru House in Oakland, California. So tune in on Facebook and follow them on their Facebook page, Uhuru Foods and Pies. They want you to know that every Saturday at the Grand Lake Farmers Market in Oakland, California, Uhuru Foods and Pies sells African comfort food to a broad base of hungry supporters. On Sunday, February 24th, Oakland will host its second Black Joy Parade with over 15,000 people anticipated. Uhuru Foods and Pies will be in the mix, selling their healthy and delicious foods and drinks, and of course, their pies. They are looking for volunteers who seek purpose in their service. Look them up and follow them on their Facebook page at Uhuru Foods and Pies. So a lot's happening around Uhuru Foods and Pies, so make sure you guys um, stay in the loop around what's going on, especially if you're in Oakland, California, you can donate some time and participate in any of these events. It's going down in St. Louis. Black Power Poetry will be live, so come see the real creative genius of the African working class. The Black Power Blueprint is hosting an open mic in the, in the house that Black built. Save the date, March 22nd at 7 p.m. in the St. Louis Aquaba Hall, located at 4101 West Florissant Avenue. Uh, Black Power Poetry and Open Mic. For more information on this event or to sign up as an artist, you can email St. Louis at apedf.org or call 314-380-0980. To learn more about the amazing project that is the Black Power Blueprint, visit blackpowerblueprint.org. On March 23rd to 24th, join the African National Women's Organization for the National Plenary being held in St. Louis, Missouri. African women's role is in the rev and the revolution is on the front lines, and ANWO helps us to understand this by showing its treme tremendous leadership of African women. All African women should be a part of ANWO, and this plenary will make it clear why. Visit anwouhuru.org to learn more about this event. April 6th and 7th, the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations will be conducting its third electoral campaign school in St. Petersburg, Florida. Do you want to learn how to run for office on a revolutionary platform such as the National Black Political Agenda for Self-Determination and win? You don't want to miss this school. With speakers from the BIB Steering Committee, including Chairman Amalia Shetela, you can learn from the best. Visit blackisbackcoalition.org to register today. The movement for white solidarity with black power is growing. Witness it at the Uhuru Solidarity National Convention April 13th and 14th in St. Louis, Missouri. Come see the growth of white reparations to African people and learn the role that white people can play in creating a future free of oppression. Visit UhuruSolidarity.org to learn more about this convention. And for all those who sadly did not win a copy of Vanguard today, you can pre-order a copy uh, for, of Chairman Amalia Chatella's latest book, Vanguard, The Advanced Attachment of the African Revolution at BurningSpearMarketplace.com. Pre-order now before the end of February and get exclusive features such as a color photo spread and an autograph from the chairman. This book is the political report to the 7th Congress and features a foreword from ASI Secretary General Louise Kinshasa, as well as international solidarity statements from anti-colonial, anti-imperialist organizations existing around the world. If you're local to St. Pete or St. Louis, at the Uhuru House, 3 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central, the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement will be hosting our weekly Black Power Sunday rallies, raising important concerns in community issues and organizing to overturn them. If you're in St. Pete, you're going to come to 1245 Tyron Lewis Avenue South, otherwise known as 18th Avenue South. And again, the Uhuru House address in St. Louis is 4101 West Florissant Avenue. Thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Amali Taught Me Sunday Study. And we're doing a Huru Congo um, today. Oh yeah, so we're doing a Huru Congo. Um, we just launched this um, YouTube page. It's called a Huru Congo. At 11 a.m. Eastern, we'll be live again with Chairman Amalia Chatella, as well as ASI Secretary General Louise Kinshasa on the situation um, and what's happening in Congo right now. So thank you all for tuning in. And 
Oh, um, no, I need. Uh, what is that? 20, 26 and 27. 6 and 27. Yes. Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Under the slogan Africa for Africans mm -hmm. at home and, and abroad. abroad. Yes. Uh, it's going to be a really important yes. uh, event. So that will be, uh, how do they get to that? Uh, um, I'll have to get more information in regards to that. I'll have that for the next Sunday. ALDUhuru.org. ALDUhuru.org for more information around African Liberation Day being held in Washington, D.C., May 26th and 27th. Um, all right, so thank you all, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you for your donations. And join us at Uhuru Congo at 11 a.m. to see Chairman Amashitela and Secretary General um, uh, Louisa Kinshasa summing up the situation in Congo. Uhuru. 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 Uhuru.